Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Colonel, when you look at everything that's just been said, one of the takeaways here is, according to a lot of experts, this is a bad thing. Uh, but it's also a bad thing that's being done uh, very effectively, which makes it worse than incompetence in pursuing a bad thing. Uh, and some people are so against Donald Trump, they seem to forget sometimes how effective he is. Uh, but when it comes to creating a, a politicized, polarized environment where people like you who've served the country in a nonpartisan way for the bulk of your career are being misperceived uh, as a, quote, deep state, uh, when in fact the agenda seems to be to change the leadership of the FBI because he's in, under investigation of the Russia probe. Well, he got Comey out, he got McCabe out, now Peter Strzok's fired, uh, and he's going after Bruce Orr's security clearance, which does limit the department you were in, right? You can't work there without one of those. Uh, and then you go out to Clapper, what if, and he pulls Hayden. what if he pulls Mueller's? And then that goes to the Mueller question, which we'll put up on the screen what you're saying, which is uh, Jeremy Bash, who was a CIA counsel, says, my concern, quote, is that Trump will strip the clearances of Bob Mueller investigative team. Um, give us your analysis, if you will, on how effective this is and how Donald Trump, who has been so underestimated politically, seems to be good at doing this bad thing. Well, I think a fundamental problem we have, Ari, is we try to analyze him as a politician. He is not a politician. He's a masterful entertainer. Indeed, he may be the most successful entertainer in history. I mean, back in the 60s, John Lennon got in trouble for saying the Beatles are more popular than Jesus. Well, I'll tell you, Trump is a lot more popular than the Beatles, and he's commanding headlines daily around the world. What other entertainer can do that? But for me, the fundamental problem, uh, I mean, everything else is a symptom, but this is a president who doesn't like our system of government who does not understand our civil government, despises the idea of the separation of powers, of sharing power, as was said here. And when it comes to the Constitution, he and many of his core supporters think it's a menu where they can pick what they like. A menu, yeah. Like the Second Amendment, don't like that First Amendment so much. And I, I see them as fundamentally un-American. Not always intentionally so. But to just wrap up Trump, Trump's genius and it's really, it's been done before by many a dictator, many a charlatan. His genius with his core supporters is that he has offered them absolution. Nothing is their fault. Mm. It's the fault of the deep state. It's the fault of minorities. It's the left. It's the fault of traditional Republicans. It's the fault of immigrants. And his message to them is, you're not responsible. Whatever failures you've had in your life, whatever bad choices you were, somebody else's fault he gives them somebody to blame and at heart his core supporters aren't builders uh, they're, they're couch potato anarchists who are just thrilled to tear things down he is a potent destructive force who as you observe but are you alleging that about all 46 percent of people who voted for him no his, his his core supporters his supporters come in a lot of different flavors but the core supporters i see as people who have been told so many times that, that they're entitled to more that despite their red hat saying america great again they're not really wild about america in fact I, that's a, something i charge i would lay at the feet of the left and the right we're an ungrateful nation Mm. We're spoiled and we're 
crying out that we deserve more. No, we don't. We've lost that fundamental, um, fundamental American value, the sense of responsibility. Trump is ultimately the, the, the theological antichrist of our political scene, arguing that nothing is your fault. I can save you. It is Monday, the 20th of August of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. And our daily special is River City Hash Mondays because it's been another long weekend. And as they all are now, and have been for a while. (laughs) And, uh, hey, it looks like uh, Donald Trump doesn't really understand the workings of government. He thinks the White House Council, not Council, Council, is his personal lawyer. The White House lawyer is the lawyer for the office of the presidency. It goes beyond any one person. And I say person because there should have been a woman as, sitting in the Oval Office as president. But there was a little something that went on, and now apparently law enforcement is trying to uh, uh, affect the midterms. Well, I think maybe they would. And as well they should. Because uh, you can't have crooks running the show. Crooks are crooks. And every time they turn around, they're doing another criminal act. And they have been. Uh, yeah, Donald Trump called McGahn a rat. Actually, he called John Dean a rat. But we know what he means. And who uses that term outside of Tony Soprano? Well, all the other mobsters in the world. Rat. Uh-huh. Well, that's uh, that's the lot that we're stuck with. And the only way they win, once again, is on the margins. They're defeated by overwhelming numbers, even even when they close seven of the nine precincts in a predominantly black uh, county in uh, Georgia to make sure that, uh, you know, the white supremacist uh, Corey Stewart, neo-Confederate, uh, has a chance of winning against the uber popular and absolutely going to get more votes, except if they can suppress the votes. Of the black lady running. Mm-hmm. Yep, you got you got the neo confederate, and you got the progressive black lady. Next thing you know, it's America because we defeat these people. Let's hope we do. Oh, what else has gone on? Too much. It's just too much. But I did curate a show for you today, and maybe we should talk about that. Well, of course, at the top, as we started here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Uh, looks like uh, Trump and his supporters actually believe the Constitution is a menu that they can pick what they like. Yep, we like this. We like the Second Amendment. That's good. First Amendment, well, only it only applies to certain people, not, you know, equality for all. Define all. Because really, what is truth? If truth isn't truth, what is I love these uh, old philosophical discussions among gangsters. Yeah, they live in their own bubble, their own silo. Well, I have an idea. Let's put them in their own silo. Uh, Maybe Pelican Bay. That might be the good place for them. Give them a little bit of what they deserve. I'm not talking about uh, uh, rehabilitation. Oh, no. No, this is retribution. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll hire a private company to exact it. Because that's the only American way that works. No, it doesn't. Well, what's on the rest of the menu? ICE lawyers are looking to reopen thousands of deportation cases that had been adjudicated closed. If there's a brown person in America that came here from another country, we're going to find them and we're going to kick them out. Yeah, rule of law, I understand what they mean by that. Trump Supreme Court pick Brett Kavanaugh committed perjury, and the GOP is suppressing evidence that proves it. And a senior Air Force general is using his power to spread far-right Christian nationalism throughout the branches of the military. It's not just the Air Force. Mm Mm-mm. 
yeah, the Air Force is a hotbed of white nationalist uh, e- extremist Christianity. Weird, isn't it? Angels. After the break, we then move to the chef's table where Trump's visa crackdown is hitting Maryland's crab industry hard. Yes, apparently the crabs aren't going to pot. And Tom Clark, renowned poet, editor, sports writer, and biographer, and I should say one of my neighbors, died early Saturday morning after being fatally struck by a motorist while walking near his North Berkeley home. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice the chat room link at the right-ish of the page, monitored by Kelly Lincoln Roaring Girl. And if you could, uh, she still needs some funds to be able to finish the upgrade on her software and hardware. So if you would please push some money her way, it would be very fantastic. Uh, to the left-ish of the chat room link are the contribute donate buttons to Netroots Radio. And, uh, so we, we still have to pay our bills too. So thank you for your generosity. And, uh, we are unable to do this without you. So thank you very much. You can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. You can also, uh, check us out over on Facebook at Netroots Radio or as Netroots Radio. You can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam, and I am also on Daily Co's as Justice Putnam, where I publish the, uh, and post, post and publish, the uh, show notes and links diary there, an integral part to the show, because, uh, yeah, I'm not just making it up. It comes from source material. And there's some other uh, tidbits of possible entertaining, uplifting, or uh, educational value for you. You'll maybe you'll see. It'll be up to you. What is truth after all? Does anyone really know? And uh, let's see what else. Oh, of course, uh, do follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. Just type in West Coast Cookbook and it'll sh- show at Cookbook West. That's where we are. But we are known as West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on Facebook. And, uh, wow. And I, I never really suggest or encourage people to go to Facebook, but a lot of people do anyway, because, uh, it's like telling people that they can't have uh, a Coca-Cola, just get a cola. They're going to get a Coca-Cola anyway. Podcasts of the show can be had by way of Spreaker, TuneIn, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays, is an article by Joshua Eaton out of Think Progress. Donald Trump is overseeing a massive uptick in requests to reopen previously closed deportation cases, according to data published by BuzzFeed News. With less than two months to go in fiscal year 2018, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement lawyers have asked federal immigration judges to reopen nearly 8,000 cases so far, almost twice the rate under President Barack Obama. There were 8,400 requests to reopen closed cases in fiscal year 2017, which included the last four months of the Obama administration. Now that we've seen the numbers, I think it is extremely scary, 
Sarah Pierce of the Migration Policy Institute told the San Diego Union Tribune, many people have been here for years living in relative peace and suddenly that is no longer true. Suddenly they are going to be back before an, an immigration judge and facing deportation. The move comes after a decision by Attorney General Jeff Sessions in May sharply limited immigration judges' ability to handle caseloads by indefinitely suspending low-priority cases, part of a broader effort by the administration to slow both legal and illegal immigration and to ramp up deportations. No more brown and black people in this country, damn it. We need more Norwegians. Just you wait. I don't know. Go, go, to, go to the Dakotas. Go to Minnesota if you want some Norwegians. Some Swedes, too. Can they really tell the difference? <sighs> there is no burden on the parties to provide a persuasive reason for recalendering or to provide any reason at all, said a June memo to ICE lawyers about Sessions' decision that was published by the American Immigration Lawyers Association. If a party moves for a case to be recalendered, the immigration judge shall recalendar the case. Unlike regular criminal and civil courts, immigration courts are part of the Department of Justice, which is in the executive, not the judicial branch. That gives Sessions the power to make decisions that are binding on immigration judges. You mean the guy who was too racist to be a Supreme Court justice back in the 80s is in the perfect spot now to make sure brown and black people suffer the way God intended them to? The effort has been accelerated by General Attorney General Jeff Sessions' ruling that immigration judges do not have the authority to administratively close cases and subsequent DHS guidance to ICE attorneys instructing them to recalendar every single case that has ever been administratively closed. <laughs> With 855,000 closed cases currently on the books, the push to reopen and adjudicate them fa faces a logistical challenge. The June memo ranked the kinds of cases that the administration wanted ICE lawyers to focus on reopening. Cases where the person is detained. Cases where the person has a criminal history. Cases where a previous ICE motion to reopen was denied. And cases closed over ICE's objection. We are the S.A. Gestapo. You tell us what we want to know, and you just do what we say, because we are the S.A. Gestapo. We're outside the rule of law. We're not part of the courts. We're part of the Department of Justice, and justice will be exacted the way we deem it. Because truth isn't truth, you know. The memo was also clear about the administration's larger goal. It is DHS's intention to recalendar all cases that were previously administratively closed for reasons other than authorization by a regulation or judicially approved settlement agreement. Offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, is out of Alternate by Matthew Chapman, who looks like he's writing for Alternate now rather than Share Blue Media. I should check out if he is continuing to write for Share Blue and doing it for both. Well, we'll check that out. One of the top concerns of Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee 
Regarding Donald Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Judge Brett Kavanaugh, is whether he knew anything about, authorized, or advised Bush administra- the Bush administration on their torture program for detainees in the war on terror while he served as White House Staff Secretary. Now, let's be clear, okay? Senator Patrick Leahy asserted that Republicans were ready to request Kavanaugh's records until they weren't. In 2006, during his confirmation to the D.C. Circuit, Kavanaugh told, Sa- Kavanaugh told senators under oath that he was not involved in the questions about the rules governing detention of combatants and had no knowledge of issues about the legal justifications or the policies relating to the treatment of detainees. However, Senators Patrick Leahy, Diane Feinstein, and Dick Durbin assert that multiple documents and email chains show Kavanaugh was briefed on the issue, implying he was not honest with the Senate. Some of the documents, Judiciary Democrats say, prove Kavanaugh's knowledge of the torture program and potentially even suggest that he perjured himself in his earlier confirmation. And uh, those uh, those documents have been marked uh, Committee Confidential by Chuck Grassley, the judici- Judiciary Chairman, meaning that even most senators are not allowed to review them. Also of concern is whether the White House is playing any role in steering document requests. Well, do you think... On Friday, Leahy submitted a letter to White House counsel Don McGahn. Yeah, the guy who's been talking to Mueller. Good thing, too. Uh, demanding to know what was discussed at a meeting between him and Judiciary Republicans regarding Kavanaugh. Yeah, well, let's re- remember here. It has been McGahn who has suggested these onerous appointments throughout the Trump administration. Okay. And he's covering as you know what. According to a press release from Leahy, prior to the meeting on July uh, 24th, uh, Republicans were prepared to ask the National Archives to release documents produced during Kavanaugh's time as White House Staff Secretary for former President George W. Bush. But after the meeting, Republicans refused to do so, allowing a limited release of documents curated by a lawyer representing the former president. In the 44 years I have served in the United States Senate, I've seen 19 nominations to the Supreme Court, including the nomination of every current member of the court, Leahy said. I have never before seen the White House under either Republican or a Democratic president usurp or direct the parameters of the Judiciary Committee's document request regarding a Supreme Court nominee. I find it troubling that the White House and Judiciary Committee Republicans are stifling transparency rather than working together to provide the necessary documents for the Senate to do its work. The American people deserve the unvarnished truth about Judge Kavanaugh. Yeah, they deserve it, but uh, they're not going to get it. Now, Chapman here are pretty much reiterates what I previously said about McGahn playing a critical role in getting Trump's parade of far-right judicial nominees waved through the Senate and has expressed his avowal to put two Supreme Court justices on the bench before leaving his role in the White House. That's McGahn, the guy talking to Mueller. In addition to pressuring Judiciary Republicans to release the full set of documents, Senate Democrats have also filed a Freedom of Information Act, and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer has threatened to sue the National Archives to make them public. Now remember, these documents fall under the Presidential Records Act.
Friday, finishing up here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Ash Mondays, is an article out of uh, Salon by Paul Rosenberg. On July 18th, Air Force Brigadier, Brigadier General John Teachert assumed command of the 412th Test Wing at Edwards Air Force Base. Less than one month later, on August 12th, the Military Religious Freedom Foundation filed a 22-page complaint against him for violating military rules and regulations about religious proselytizing, based on the online record at Teachert's Christian Ministry Website Plus, which stands for Prayer at Lunchtime for the United States, which has been in operation for five years, well before his latest promotion. Within the week, the Military Religious Freedom Foundation, or MRFF, a watchdog group founded in 2005, received word that the Department of of Defense was beginning a formal investigation. According to a press statement from MRFF founder and president Michael L. Weinstein, a former Air Force officer himself, on Teacher's website that he has denigrated LGBT individuals, slammed American society at large, and, of course, delivered election voting mandate directives, urging that only certain categories of Christians should be elected to public office. Military officers enjoy the same freedom of religion as everyone else in America, so a teacher's religious faith is not an issue in of itself. But military service entails special restrictions on how religion is expressed, particularly if that expression is deemed to undermine military effectiveness, a point that lies at the heart of the complaint. For example, Air Force Instruction 1-1, paragraph 2.15.4, states the following. Airmen who provide commentary and opinions on Internet blogs that they host or on others' Internet blogs, may not place comments on those blog sites which reasonably can be anticipated or intended to degrade morale, good order, and discipline of any members or units of the U.S. Armed Forces, are are service discrediting, or would degrade the trust and confidence of the public in the United States Air Force. The complaint was filed on behalf of 41 clients at Teacher's New Command, 32 of whom identify as Christian, many of whom are in mortal fear of retaliation should they personally be identified in this matter, something that uh, the MRFF suggests is an equally troublesome issue. Elsewhere, the complaint argues that Teacher's specific form of zealotry does not promote diversity, Unit cohesion, good order and discipline, religious tolerance and esprit de corps, all considered core values of the the 21st century military. Weinstein summarized the issue this way. When you tell somebody, and you're a general in the Air Force speaking to a subordinate, that you lack integrity, character, honor, honorability, intelligence, courage, etc. because of your chosen religious faith or lack thereof, There is no difference between that and telling that someone they're stupid because of the color of their skin or because they were born without a penis. Now, Teacher fervently believes that America was founded as a Christian nation and has fallen away from its exalted original state. The cultural resonance of these views, although they represent fake history, helps give cover to activity that would otherwise cause outrage. All right, we better get on to our break because time's a flying and there's so much more to go through. And uh, you can read the rest of this commentary uh, uh, at the link provided on the diary that I post at Daily's Co's, so please do that. All right, let's get on with our break. And when we come back, we will go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again.
from a point at sea to the circles of your mind. A new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, a dramedy in two acts. Blind Spotting is one of the few films that lives up to the label dramedy. It's co-written by the leads David Diggs and Raphael Casal, who stars lifelong friends Colin and Miles. The story picks up during the final three days of Colin's probation for an earlier crime. On the first day, he witnesses a police shooting of an unarmed man, which leaves him shaken but determined to get through the probation and go on with his life. Unfortunately, Miles, despite his genuine love for his friend, isn't quite as determined. The two men work together for a moving company and spend lots of time driving around Oakland, a place where they both grew up but no longer recognize. The question isn't if Oakland is gentrifying, but rather how rapidly and whether there will still be room for people like Colin and Miles. One scene portrays the men stopping at a local convenience store and discovering they now sell $10 bottles of supposedly healthy green juice. When we later learn what originally landed Colin in prison, we see that all hipster encounters are not so comical. Blind spotting, a term coined by Colin's ex-girlfriend who is studying psychology, refers to the phenomenon of seeing a single two-dimensional form that can be easily perceived as either of two very different things. The vase versus two human profiles example is used here symbolically. In Colin's case, his record and blackness make it impossible for people to overlook his criminal past, whereas for Miles, his whiteness makes it a challenge for him to be seen as authentic, despite being as much a part of Oakland's culture as Colin. Blind spotting is one of the best of 2018 so far. It's powerful, well done, and is as relevant as films get. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Marissa Shea. One of the delights of summer is watching monarch butterflies dancing through the air, but it's becoming harder to see them in certain locales. In some places, the population has dropped by as much as 90%, and climate change may make life even more challenging for these charismatic insects. That's because higher carbon dioxide levels can lower the amount of toxins in milkweed, the monarch caterpillar's food. The caterpillars use those toxins to protect themselves from a deadly parasite that produces spores. When the caterpillars are really small, those spores get into the the monarch's gut um, and they break apart and they start drilling holes in the gut lining and reproducing and just doing nasty parasite things that are bad for the monarchs. Leslie Decker, an ecologist at Stanford University. Decker and her colleagues raised hundreds of monarchs. They fed half the caterpillars milkweed grown at current CO2 levels. The other half got milkweed grown at nearly double those CO2 levels. What we found is that elevated CO2 changes the medicinal quality of the milkweed in a way that makes monarchs sicker. They're less able to tolerate their pathogen, so the parasite becomes more hurtful to them. Um, And it also reduces their overall lifespan um, when they're infected in comparison to uninfected monarchs. The caterpillars that ate milkweed grown with more carbon dioxide grew into butterflies that died as much as a week earlier than the normal lifespan. As a human, you think, oh, well, that's not that meaningful. But then as an insect or as an insect that needs to reproduce within a week, it's pretty important. The study is in the journal Ecology Letters. Decker says these findings are not just about butterflies and milkweed. Many of our medicines come from plants. And so what this study is highlighting to us, or at least creating a red flag for, is the fact that the medicinal compounds in those plants could be changing under elevated CO2. They could be going up or down, but it could mean that we lose the medicinal efficacy, the protective ability of that green pharmacy around us. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Marissa Shea. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. 
Pools, water parks, and other recreational water venues are popular places to relax and stay cool, but they can be sources of serious illness. Since 2000, nearly 500 outbreaks have been reported at recreational water venues in the U.S., resulting in over 27,000 illnesses and eight deaths. Most were caused by parasites, bacteria, viruses, or certain chemicals in the water. Parents with young children who have diarrhea should not allow their children to swim or play in the water. In addition, bathers should check the inspection scores of pools and water parks and can conduct mini inspections using test strips before getting in the water. A few simple precautions can allow you to share the fun, not the germs. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Hey, kids and parents, it's back to school time. As you shop for school supplies and get ready for class, make sure you have emergency plans in place. Did you know that emergency preparedness plays a major role in school life? Throughout the year, schools actively prepare for natural disasters, outbreaks, and other emergency situations. Students and parents need to be aware and learn what to do during an emergency. Every family should build an emergency kit, make a family disaster plan, and be informed about events that could affect their community. Parents, take a few extra steps to help children be prepared. Make sure they know the full name, address, and phone numbers of parents or guardians. In our high-tech world of cell phones, memorizing emergency phone numbers is very important. Include a copy of this information in their backpack. Other items to keep in their backpack include water and non-perishable snacks, a pocket-sized first aid kit, a whistle to alert others for help, and a list of allergies, medical conditions, and medications. Make sure their school and teacher have a copy, too. Be familiar with different routes and ways to travel home, like walking, taking the bus, or riding home with another student who lives nearby. Establish a secret code word with your child and whoever takes them home from school to protect against an unauthorized person picking them up. This list is a great starting point to prepare your student for the upcoming school year. Customize these steps to fit your child's capabilities and needs. Ask school administrators and teachers about emergency preparedness plans so you know what steps they are taking to keep your child safe. Many schools have guidelines on how to shelter in place during natural disasters, how to secure classrooms during an emergency lockdown, and how to teach preparedness curriculum to students. Remember, emergency preparedness is important for everyone. Children who are prepared are more confident during stressful emergency situations. By following preparedness guidelines, parents, children, and school staff can improve their safety and peace of mind. For more information on school emergency preparedness, visit cdc.gov slash children slash schools. To learn more about disasters and emergency preparedness, follow at CDC Emergency on Twitter or visit emergency.cdc.gov. So let's get prepared. Have a great school year. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Who are the American founders? The founders were the political leaders of the 13 original colonies during the era of the American Revolution and its aftermath. They were also key figures in the establishment of the United States of America and in framing and ratifying the U.S. Constitution. George Washington was the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War and our first president. George Mason was another Virginian and an influential founder. Mason was the primary author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights of 1776, which had a great influence on Thomas Jefferson, who adopted many of Mason's ideas for the Declaration of Independence. John Adams was a leader of the American Revolution. He served on the committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. He was also a man of principles, serving six years earlier as the lawyer for the defense of the British soldiers who stood trial for the Boston Massacre. He would later become our country's second president. Abigail Adams was her husband's closest confidant, advocating in particular for women's rights, 
writing to John that he should remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. She continued, Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. You can help stop the Trump agenda in its tracks. Make sure you're registered to vote. Go to rocktheVote.org. And on November 6th, vote for Democrats up and down the ticket. This message, a public service from all the fine people of NetRootsRadio.com. Can the Trump administration make millions of people invisible? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. In a 2016 case, the United States Supreme Court reaffirmed that the Constitution requires representation in the House of Representatives, and thus the Electoral College, to be determined by a state's and the country's total population, which includes voters and non-voters, children and adults, long-term and short-term residents, citizens and non-citizens alike. An accurate enumeration, the Constitution's 18th century word for a census, is the prerequisite. But... The Trump administration is disingenuously trying to circumvent this constitutional requirement by inserting into the 2020 census a question about citizenship, which serves no legitimate purpose, has not been included in the census for some 60 years, and targets immigrants. After all, who would answer a question or fill out a form that could cause law enforcement, thing Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, to target you, a parent or your child or even a distant relative or a friend living in your home for possible incarceration or deportation? The answer is no one would do that, which is why 17 state attorneys general have sued in federal court to stop the citizenship question from being included in the census, to stop the Trump administration from making immigrants invisible, and rather to ensure that in America everyone is counted, because everyone counts. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. The U.S. is reappropriating nearly $200 million originally earmarked for stabilizing parts of Syria recaptured from the Islamic State. The U.S. is citing new financial pledges from the likes of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which have pledged $100 million and $50 million, respectively. On Friday, senior U.S. officials praised coalition burden-sharing for allowing the U.S. to spend its money elsewhere, But not everyone is convinced that's a good idea. We have to be very careful about assuming equivalence in dollars from the Gulf and dollars from the U.S. Stephen Hademan directs the Middle East Studies program at Smith College. The problem is that unless the U.S. is prepared to make a financial commitment, it receives none of the benefits that its finances might bring. The U.S. leaned heavily on Kurdish groups in eastern Syria while battling the Islamic State, and cities like Raqqa were obliterated as a part of coalition airstrikes. Heidemann says causing that damage but leaving the country before rebuilding is done calls into question the depth of U.S. commitment to its Syrian allies. Our credibility has been tested because we cut those funds. To outsource the provision of funding to regional players doesn't do anything to improve our standing with partners in the East that have been critical for our military effort there. For now, U.S. officials say they're confident the Islamic State is on its heels but a new U.N. report suggests up to 30,000 Islamic State soldiers remain in Iraq and Syria, waiting for an opportune moment to renew their fight. And by letting others pick up the pieces in Syria, Heidemann says the U.S. might be tempting fate. The Trump administration has made the anti-ISIS campaign the cornerstone of our presence in Syria. Trump has been enormously vocal about his success in defeating ISIS, and yet he's not providing the basic nuts and bolts that would ensure that any success he's right to claim can be sustained. Luke Vargas, the United Nations.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. River City Hash Mondays, that's right. Oh, boy. It's still good stuff. We, we, we always put together the good stuff. In fact, now that you're at the chef's table, have a French 77, the most balanced cocktail in the history of cocktailing. Well, let's begin uh, weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 56 degrees. That's uh, a nice, cool beginning to the morning. We will be going up uh, to nearly the same temperature that we had yesterday, which was in the mid-90s. And compared to the triple digits that we had been experiencing for quite a while, mid-90s feels rather pleasant. It does. Uh, Though the region has an active air quality alert, uh, it's pretty good here. Uh, Moderate is what the uh, index shows at, what, 58 parts per million? Is that what it is right now? On D, that's what they're calling it. Um, though, if I were to go by the color spectrum of what the sun looks like, I think it's a little bit better, uh, in the, the microclimate I'm at here ringed by some ridge crests. Is that redundant ridge and crest? Hmm. Uh, regardless, uh, it's pretty nice. And, uh, but we have to take care because winds could shift and, uh, bring smoke in back into this little area. Though I must say, uh, the Cal fire, uh, said that they not only have a handle on the Shasta fire, but, uh, they pretty much well have pretty much well knocked it down. So there's some mop up to do and, uh, they've got it down to, uh, you know, less than a hundred acres or so. And that was a massive fire, not very far from uh, uh, the mothership here in southern Oregon. So that's good to hear. Uh, what do we have? Oh, partly cloudy. Uh, that high will be that. That's the forecast for today. The high near ninety-five. Uh, right now it's sunny, with the winds out of the west southwest about one to two miles per hour. Of course, we'll be increasing to five to ten miles an hour, shifting out of the north. And will remain that way overnight through tomorrow. Low tonight is 65, though it looks like we're going to be bumping those triple digits tomorrow. We don't... Come on. Give us a little bit cooler weather, please. Grass pollen is low if you suffer from that. Once again, the air quality index is considered moderate for the area at 58 parts per million. And uh, the daytime UV index is high... Though down to seven, and it had been up to nine and then down to eight and now down to seven. I consider that to be maybe the angle of the sun, but also uh, there's still smoke in the area. All right. Though low pressure is sitting off the coast, high pressure is kind of keeping it out, darn you. And high pressure is rising at the moment at 29.92 inches. Visibility is up to nine miles and you relative humidity is at 66 percent. Well, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 76 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 74 and cloudy. Wow, that's a rather pleasant uh, uh, temperature for Paris in August. What's up? Now, Rome is 68 with a thunderstorm, and of course, they do have a active electrical thunderstorm watch that could knock out critical infrastructure like their electric grid. And that's usually what happens in Paris, too, right now. So maybe right now they're they're just cloudy at 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Very, very pleasant. All right. Well, Kiev is 82 and fair. Kabul is 85 and fair. Hong Kong. 78 and mostly cloudy. Tokyo is 77 and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 48 degrees and clear. They're they're getting towards their winter, you know. Or actually, I think maybe they're getting towards their spring. That's what it is. 
San Francisco, California is 54 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy with an active air quality alert for smoke in the Bay Area. So take care of there. And New York, New York is 69 degrees Fahrenheit with fog. Take care if you're out on the Hudson or wherever a waterway might be. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. First offering here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is Out of Think Progress by E.A. Crunden. Businesses on Maryland's eastern shore are feeling the sting from Trump's America First immigration and visa policies as establishments struggle to hire workers. Crab picking houses typically enjoy busy summer seasons in Maryland, which is famous for its seafood. But this year, around a third of crab picking jobs remain unfulfilled due to a shortage in seasonal labor. You know, we used to have open borders. People would come over, take a seasonal job, pay taxes on their earnings and go back across the border, back and forth. And we go across the border and have fun and have dinner and whatnot and a few drinks, maybe a dance, maybe a serenade. And then we come back across the border ourselves, back and forth. Not anymore, because brown people are evil, criminal rapists. All of them. Even the babies. Business owners say the program is vital to their efforts, as many U.S. citizens are uninterested in the work and rarely seek it out. Oh, that's the H-2B visa program, which allows workers to come from other countries for a brief stint before returning home. And, uh, yeah, so that's... uh, Uh, Crackdowns on those, meaning that uh, if you're brown, you're out of here. Black? (laughs) Don't even think it. Unless you work for a... Oh, no, no. I have to look at that because Trump really doesn't like people of color working at his resorts. Polish people without hard hats on the construction sites paid less than minimum wage. Oh, yeah, he loves those people. U.S. citizens are, of course, uninterested in the work. Uh, Harry Phillips, owner of Russell Hall Seafood, said that the new system has cost his business dearly. There's nothing going on at all because we haven't got our pickers, Phillips said. Efforts to offer incentives like higher wages and overtime isn't having much of an impact, especially when you know you never know when the S.A. Gestapo is going to come in and take you away because you had a parking ticket. You rapist. Meanwhile, the situation could mean dramatic changes. Uh, Businesses elsewhere are uh, considering taking their businesses elsewhere. If the crackdown continues. What future is going to be here if we don't know if we're going to get our workers? Our girls are right in Mexico and they have crabs just like we have. That was uh, the owner of uh, Philip Seafood, by the way. Another business owner, Brian Hall said that while he'd been lucky enough to obtain 30 visas, he resented the visa program changes regardless, as they are hurting his friends. Hall, a Trump voter, told uh, the Washington Post that the president should fix the issue immediately. Yeah, well, you know what? We could fix it very much if people like you hadn't voted for him. Because, what, you wanted to kick brown and black people, and now they happen to be friends of yours that are getting kicked? Some Maryland crab businesses have already shut down, bowing to the weight of growing costs. The crisis is also sparking a domino effect, leading to a decline in the number of jobs for Americans employed as dock workers, truck drivers, and related professions. See how that works? Visa workers come here, work in the packing houses, 
and then people got to pick it up and those are union drivers and and uh retailers have to get to sell it now they don't have any product and everybody's losing a job because uh you know you got to kick the brown and black people Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est doux Tracy Taylor of uh, from the Berkeley side uh, brings us some uh, really tragic, sad, sad news out of Berkeley. And uh, um, here is the last offering at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Uh, an old neighbor of mine in Berkeley, uh, Tom Clark, renowned poet, editor, sports writer, and biographer, uh, was walking uh, near his home in near the Alameda, which is a really big, dark uh, uh, boulevard, at 8.40 on Friday. And uh, though he was... Uh, alert and talking he suffered uh, a pretty bad arm injury and a head injury he was lucid but uh, four hours later he took a turn for the worse and did succumb to his injuries he was 77 and he was born in Chicago and attended the University of Michigan married Angelica Hennig in 68 New York he wrote dozens of books his most recent included Light and Shade New and Selected Poems out of Coffee House, and uh, Threnody out of Effing Press. Clark wrote many poems about sports figures, including poems about baseball players Catfish Hunter, Vida Blue, and Bert Campanaris, as well as a history of Oakland A's baseball, of the Oakland A's baseball team. Clark developed a love for sports early in life as he served as an usher at Wrigley Field in Chicago, where he saw such renowned figures of the era as Joe DiMaggio, Bobby Hull, Sugar Ray Robinson, and Harry S. Truman. Now, I know Sugar Ray, Bobby Hull, and Harry S. Truman were not baseball players. Hockey, boxing, and the President of the United States in order. His experiences among these figures are reflected in his poems, which he frequently feature which frequently feature these and other prominent figures from the 50s and the 60s. Now, Clark studied in England and traveled across the country, hitchhiked with Ginsburg, who who he actually had uh, a bit of uh, uh, differences and disagreed with uh, Ginsburg publicly. And he read his poetry with other writers such as Robert Graves, Gregory Corso, and Adrian Mitchell, and uh, he wrote, also wrote a biography of Jack Kerouac, which is well-renowned, as well as other renowned biographies on Olson, Charles Olson, Robert Creeley, and Ed Dorn. And uh, just a sad, sad, sad story. I would see uh, Tom Clark around town. Now, we weren't intimate, but, you know, Berkeley is pretty much of a small town, especially when uh, school is not in session. And... Uh, I'd see him around town and see him at various events. And uh, we'd go to, uh, we all, we, we had related friends and we'd see each other at dinners in people's houses. And I saw him read many, many times. And uh, just a uh, erudite, friendly, friendly man. And so, so sad that he passed. Walking, because that's what he did. He walked all over Berkeley and wrote about Berkeley, not from the radical point of view of Berkeley's history, but but the small nooks and crannies of the neighborhoods of Berkeley. So pick up his work and say a small prayer. All right, we got to get out of here, and we will be back tomorrow for Terrytown Shouter Tuesdays, and um, Netroots Radio will have does have breaking news 
breaking right now. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio, and we will visit with you tomorrow. In West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver